Uh, my name is Lisa Fagan Davis. I'm the Executive Director of the Medieval Academy of America. So grateful to all of you for joining us. Very grateful to our panelists and to Aphrodisia McCannon and Geraldine Heng for organizing this uh, session today. It is going to be recorded, uh, so if you do not want your name showing up as, uh, as having attended, you may wish to depart. Um, all of the attendees have given their permission for the session to be recorded and posted, and that will take place sometime in the next day or two. If you have questions, please use the form uh, linked in the chat window, and those questions will be forwarded to Aphrodisia uh, for uh, discussion later. At this point, I'm going to hand it over to Aphrodisia uh, to get things started. Thank you all very much for being here. Hello, everyone, and welcome. So I um, just want to give you a little bit of background about this uh, webinar. And after the um, killing of George, George Floyd, I'm just moving my document over, after the killing of George Floyd and the sort of vast protest movement that it sparked, um, many institutions wanted to respond, right, to discuss race and racism and sort of racially motivated violence and um, in the United States and beyond. So Geraldine Hang, who's a counselor uh, at the Medieval Academy of America, suggested that maybe the chair of the fairly new uh, Inclusivity and Diversity Committee, maybe that chair could preside over a series of webinars sort of discussing these, these topics. Uh, my name is Aphrodisia McCannon, and I am that chair. Uh, so welcome to our first webinar, uh, talking about uh, sort of race, racism, teaching, um, all the things that are sort of sparked by the sort of events of the of the past few weeks. We decided to begin with pedagogy because although there's a lot of resources out there on uh, teaching and researching this topic, and you'll be made familiar with some of them in the webinar. Often it's helpful to listen to the thoughts, the practices, the models of other educators. And it's my hope that our four speakers will spark some ideas that you can use as soon as this fall and encourage you to read and think deeper um, about the topic. I'd like to thank Geraldine um, for her suggestion uh, and the four speakers who have graciously agreed to participate and the Medieval Academy for giving us this, this platform. Um, a few nuts and bolts. Um, uh, as Lisa um, said, after our speakers present, there is a Q&A period. So if you do have questions, go ahead and fill out that form and I will try to sort of uh, get through those questions um, as well as I can at the end of the event. Uh, it's going to be recorded. So if you know someone who wanted to see the event and couldn't see the event, you can forward them on to the recording. And last but not least, the participants are all uh, agreed to allow the event to be tweeted live. So if you want a live tweet, go ahead and do that. Without further ado, uh, our first speaker. Our first speaker is Hussein Fancy. Hussein Fancy's research and writing focus on the medieval Mediterranean. His first book, The Mercenary Mediterranean, which received the Herbert Baxter Adams Prize for Best First Book in European History from the American Historical Association, examined the service of Muslim soldiers from North Africa to the Christian kings of the crown of Aragon in the 13th and 14th centuries. He's currently working on two projects. The first follows the activities of criminal merchants, that's pirates and smugglers, and rethinks the relationships between religion and trade. The second project examines Western views of Islam from the seventh century to the present. Professor Fancy was a junior fellow of the Michigan Society of Fellows, a Carnegie Scholar, an ACLS Fellow, and a Rome Prize Fellow at the American Academy in Rome. His presentation is, in, is titled, The Hidden Syllabus. Hussein? Thanks, Aphrodisia, for that introduction. I, I, I think the first thing I want to say is how weird it is to talk to a green dot uh, and not see everyone's faces, but this is where we are. Um, Thank you, Aphrodisia, for that introduction. I also, I want to reiterate and thank again Aphrodisia and Geraldine Hang for organizing this and, and several other important panels that are coming behind it. Their efforts behind the scene have been tireless and absolutely extraordinary. So a thank you again. Uh, I'm, I'm really honored to be here. Um, 
before I begin, I think I want to acknowledge three things. First, as I look at my fellow pan panelists, I want to recognize the manner in which diversity work falls disproportionately on the shoulders of scholars of color and, and often untenured ones. And while this is urgent work, it risks becoming a distraction. I think unless we see this as intellectual work and really commit ourselves uh, to structural change, this kind of diversity work only transforms into a means of managing, of taming and containing repeated calls for equity. I think it achieves the opposite ultimately then of what it aims to do and it frankly devours the very people that it purports to aid. So that, that's the first thing I wanted to say before I get going. The second thing I want to acknowledge is the very moment that we're living in, the coronavirus, the murder of George Floyd, the Black Lives Matter protests, the disproportionate effect that these events have had on people in this country and indeed around the world have rendered, I think, obvious to all but the most obdurate people that the basic and, uh, you know, what the basic and enduring structural inequalities of our society and world are. They've rendered obvious the intersection of issues of race, class, and gender. And at the same time, I want to recognize that that is a really overwhelming thing and that it is all too much, that we're all physically and mentally exhausted. So uh, I'm extremely heartened to see the number of people who have joined in this webinar, even though I can't see your faces. I am imagining you all as very sincere and engaged educators who want to make a difference. And I'm, I'm speaking to you in that manner, even though I can't see your eyes. I can only see a green dot. Third and last, I, I want to say that I agreed to be on this panel because I considered it my responsibility as a senior scholar to share in this work, but not because I consider myself to be an authority or an expert on the subject. The challenge of teaching race is an incredibly formidable one one that cannot be mastered in 15 minutes or even an hour or two hours, and it is one that is filled with a number of pitfalls. So I want to acknowledge that there are those who have already devoted a great deal of time and thinking to the questions of race and pedagogy. To give just one example, two weeks ago, the Folger Library, as part of their critical race conversations, uh, hosted a discussion between Amrin Dadaboy and Neda Medizade, which I would encourage everyone to watch if you haven't already. Um, I put a link to it in my bibliography. I believe Nair as well has done that. She's the one who uh, alerted me to it. Uh, Ambreen and Neda included a number of really excellent, excellent resources on pedagogy. And I don't think in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to be able to match them for intelligence, eloquence, or coherence. They did a wonderful job. Because my own experience of studying and teaching race over the last 10 to 15 years, um, has been manifold, it has been intellectual, it has been activist, it has been extremely effective. I also want to admit that those streams have often caused countercurrents in my own self. They've only produced a kind of brackish sort of beliefs in me. So in what follows, I am presenting my own evolving and inchoate thoughts. The title of my remarks is The Hidden Syllabus. The expression, for those who haven't heard it, refers to the norms, perspectives, and values that students are expected to know or are implicitly communicated to them on college and university campuses. The hidden syllabus refers not only to a body of texts, which we're all expected to know but not necessarily have read, but also to things like comportment, tone, and the very notion of critical thinking, by which I mean something like dispassionate discussion. In my own classes, I assign Michael Warner's uncritical reading to get students to think explicitly about the classroom as not simply a place of exploration, a neutral space, but also a space of a discipline, an ideal with, extremely, uh, with extreme flaws and limits. And by speaking openly to students about the hidden syllabus, I hope to make my students see that success in the college classroom is also a measure of, or is a measure of cultural competence. And by speaking to them openly about it, I hope to pull back the curtain a little bit to help them see the levers and the pulleys that are off stage. But leaving this unspoken, I think I would risk reinforcing inequalities and naturalizing the differences of race, class, or gender that might otherwise play out silently in the classroom. My charge today was to offer you some 
practical advice about addressing race in your syllabus, which I will do, but I have to admit that I had a really hard time getting to the syllabus, getting to the content of what I put in my classes. Thinking about the hidden syllabus has also made me think about all the work I do before I arrive at my formal syllabus that is, or at least used to be the one that I print, staple, and pass around at the beginning of the semester. I will admit that in the wake of the Black Lives Matter protests, I opened up the file on my computer that contains the general exam lists that I give to graduate students, and I added a section entitled Race and Racism. And I included names like that of Peter Billard, David Nirenberg, Geraldine Hang, and Cord Whitaker, all of whose works have influenced my own thinking on the subject. But in that act of segregating that material, of setting it apart and aside, I also had this troubling feeling that in my effort to combat one form of essentialism, I was slipping into another. And the trouble with opening up a space in a syllabus, adding a day on race in the Middle Ages to a survey course is that one risks marginalizing a topic that is meant to resist marginalization, that ones up naturalizing a subject that is meant to resist naturalization. When we talk about race, as when we talk about things like religion, class, or gender, I think this threat of essentialism is ever present. And I would suggest that one way to resist this is to lay bare the work that goes into our syllabus, bringing those hidden intellectual structures and practices into view and to question as part of our preparation and indeed as part of our pedagogy, as part of our teaching. In other words, the work of addressing race and inequity um, in and affecting change through a syllabus must mean more than adding three inches of new material to an already defined curriculum. Being someone who is particularly adept at self-criticism in the weeks before this webinar, I decided to focus the lens upon my own reading and citational practices to take an audit of my own bookshelves as it were. And I would urge you to do the same. The inspiration I'll admit came from a challenge I received to audit my six-year-old daughter's bookshelf to see how many books were written by and about black indigenous or people of color, how many depicted children with disabilities, how many depicted children in other parts of the world and so on. It was an illuminating exercise. And while a certain world wariness has made me feel less optimistic about the ability of reading books and watching movies to cultivate meaningful and radical empathy with others, this audit nevertheless cast really valuable light, I think, on my habits and my own structures of mind. In any case, like many of you, I imagine I maintain bibliographic software to organize books and articles. On last count, I had 6,929 references. And within the software that I use, which is called Bookends, I have the ability to sort these entries according to how recently I modified them, which ones I've cited and how often, which ones I've annotated. I was able to quickly collect a list of the most common presses and journals I read or reference. Isolating about 500 works that I've cited most often, I studied them for their representation of women, and scholars of color. I recorded how many were written in a language other than English. I dug a little deeper to see how many scholars I could find who were writing from the global south. My methods may make the more numerate among you cringe a little bit, but they were more than sufficient to make something readily apparent to me. Before this audit, I would have easily rattled off enough names to convince myself that I satisfied all these categories, that I was progressive in my reading practices. But seen within the totality of my reading and my citational practices, I could see that I fall far, far short of my own sense of self. That disconnect between my imagined and actual reading practices was frankly disturbing. Nevertheless, this audit also has had the value of bringing my unconscious reading habits into view in a way that has offered some practical solutions, some ways to mitigate my obvious failures. So what have I done? I have signed up to receive the table of contents from journals and electronic catalogs from presses that I value, but for some reason don't follow regularly or don't read enough. Uh, I do this knowing that elite journals and presses are often the slowest to change and that their editorial boards shouldn't be making decisions for me about what I choose to read. I've also set up Google Scholar alerts for several scholars, particularly junior scholars that I'd like to read more of and follow more closely. Uh, I've added dozens of new entries to my bibliography, making sure to tag these and file them alongside the projects that I have in process, my reading lists. I've also ordered books, voting with my research dollars, 
And of course, I read outside medieval studies. I wade widely into um, studies in religion, intellectual history, anthropology, Middle Eastern studies. And I task myself to also do the same in those fields to increase representation. And I'm still thinking about other things to do, and I, I really welcome suggestions. I'd be happy to hear from any of you, maybe not all of you at once, but uh, I'd be happy to talk more and get ideas. But put simply, my aim is to expand what I read, actively engage with, advocate for, and cite. My point in saying all this is that the challenge of addressing race in the syllabus must go far beyond adding or acquiescing to add a section on race or a scholar of color which risks simply becoming a form of tokenism. What I'm asking of myself is to think consciously about how I read and work, to read outside my areas of comfort, to add new scholars to my reading lists, and to engage with rather than dismiss or ignore work that I may disagree with at first blush. I wanna be more conscious of the choices I make well before I arrive at writing my graduate and undergraduate syllabi. I know that some vital questions are gonna come up in the question and answer period. For instance, the question of whether it's appropriate even to use the word race for the Middle Ages. So I'm not gonna address it right now, but I will talk about it in, in eventually. Um, so in the brief time that I have remaining, I would be remiss if I didn't offer you some practical advice for those of, or some practical advice for those of you who are planning your syllabi and not simply uh, tell you that I'm mired in self-doubt. I uh, am a scholar of medieval Iberian North Africa. And although much of the recent scholarship on race is centered on Northern Europe, particularly England, it's worth pointing out the lengthy and robust debates about race in medieval Iberia. After all, it was arguably in medieval Iberia that the word race, or raza, first came to stand for bi the biological reproduction of human difference, specifically in reference to conversos, that is the Jewish converts to Christianity. As a guide to these lengthy debates and the appearance of the term in medieval sources, I would refer you to first to an essay by David Nirenberg, as well as a relevant primary source and translation, both of which appear in my bibliography. But if Iberia has been a curiously marginal topic in this moment, I would say that the question of race in the Islamic world is even more so. It may be true that there were few studies on this topic decades ago when Bernard Lewis complained that of their absence, but that's no longer the case. And I want to mention in here advocate for work by Michael Gomez uh, and Rachel Shine, who've addressed attitudes towards skin color in different Islamic contexts. I also want to recommend the work of Maribel Fierro and Manuela Ceballos, as well as a good translation of an Arabic primary source on attitudes towards Jewish converts to Islam in North Africa. This last primary source, I think, makes an excellent teaching tool precisely because it provides a fascinating comparison with the Iberian case. I think we can all quickly adapt it and use it, particularly those of us who are already uh, familiar with the Iberian material. And again, I have to credit David Nirenberg here for pointing out this valuable comparison to me. Before I conclude, I just wanna be clear about one thing. I am not advocating for the inclusion of Islamic sources because I think they offer us new clues about the roots of race and racism. Indeed, I think it's a trap to think that there is only one history of race, a single genealogy. And I would call this trap the threat of essentialism or universalism, and I think it's one that hovers over all historical thinking. Instead, I wanna urge you to consider adding Islamic sources to your syllabus in the coming year or years, because they provide a means for us to provincialize medieval Europe. They can contribute to a critical history and theory of race that doesn't yield to naturalizing metaphors or naturalizing ideas, but rather keeps us attuned to the multiple ways in which race and racism worked across history. The power of comparison then is to highlight meaningful differences and to ask, ask how, when, and why these differences mattered. Thanks. Our next speaker is Sarah Powell. Sarah Powell is the assistant curator of early books and manuscripts at the Houghton Library at Harvard University, where she supports the development and use of the library's pre-1800 collections with an emphasis on medieval and Renaissance manuscripts. Sarah holds an MS in Library and Information Science from Simmons University, where her study was supported by a Mosaic Program Fellowship from the Association of Research Libraries and Society of American Archivists, and by a Spectrum Scholarship from the American Library Association. 
She also holds an MA in Medieval Studies from the University of York, where her research focused on social history in late medieval England. Previously, she held research and instruction uh, librarian positions at the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Yale and Swarthmore's College, Swarthmore College's Libraries. Go on, Thank you. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Is that good? Okay. Um, so I've changed my title a bit from what it was on the website since I first started thinking about this. Um, but the gist is the same. I'm going to be talking about how to make manuscripts and manuscript studies accessible um, for a range of students. Um, and I want to preface by saying that my training in medieval studies was very Eurocentric or Anglocentric even, and I don't have any particular expertise in non-Western books and manuscripts. Um, but I do have expertise in libraries and special collections, so I hope that I offer suggestions for ways that you can incorporate materials into your teaching with special collections that go beyond the Western canon's greatest hits or, you know, beautifully illuminated European books. Um, and I also want to acknowledge before I begin that, um, you know, I work at Harvard. My previous position was at um, the Beinecke Library. Oops. Sorry, I was looking at the chat. Um, so I've had the experience to, the privilege experience of working at institutions with really strong um, early book and manuscript collections, but I think that um, some of the teaching suggestions I offer can be adapted to an online environment where the world of digitized um, manuscripts is your oyster and also a range of repositories. And my suggestions are mainly for an undergraduate audience, but I think they could be adapted to graduate level courses as well. Uh, so my number one advice before you bring your class to special collections um, in person or online is to identify a learning outcome and think about what you want your students to learn or gain from the visit. And this might seem very straightforward and obvious, um, but I've worked with a lot of faculty and instructors whose goals are not any more clearly defined than they want their students to see um, manuscripts. Um, so think about to what end. Uh, for example, if you want to focus on manuscript form and function, then you might preface with a lecture on how manuscripts are made. If you want to focus on handwriting, how about a mini paleography intro? Again, this might seem obvious, but um, I worked with classes where instructors sort of expect their students to be able to read late medieval or early modern uh, materials just because they're in English. Um, but you want to provide your students with a way into the material. Um, next, consult with library staff, so talk to a librarian, archivist, or curator about your learning goals and how the session will fit into your syllabus. Um, so this goes beyond having specific items in mind. Uh, you might have particular formats or genres that you'd like to see. Um, and this is important because materials might be poorly described or indeed entirely uncatalogued. And I think that is much more likely to be the case if you're um, interested in incorporating materials that are in non-Western European languages. And then finally, let your students know what to expect, orient them to special collections and archives. Um, let them know that uh, they're going to be, there's our security procedures, they're going to be constantly surveilled um, and introduce them to handling guidelines. And again, this might, you might be wondering why I'm mentioning these things in a panel on race and pedagogy in medieval studies. Um, and I think, uh, when I was thinking about this, um, I think often when we imagine a medieval studies class, we think of an all or mostly white student body um, or class, um, and that is not going to be the case, right? Students come from different backgrounds. They have different levels of experience or familiarity with museums, archives, and special collections, and therefore different levels of comfort. And it can be understandably anxiety-inducing to enter these spaces for the first time or even for the 50th time. So I think, as Hussein said, we have to it's good to pull back the curtain. Um, you know, special collections are not neutral spaces. And in fact, they're traditionally white privileged spaces. And the buildings and the collections often reflect this. For example, the library profession um, in the US today is over 85% white. Um, and again, that's why I think it's important to talk about handling because it helps balance the sense of wonder with accessibility. So it should be really amazing and awe-inspiring to encounter um, you know, medieval manuscripts for the first time, but they're not static objects. They are interactive and they're there to be used. 
So students should know that these materials are saved for them for research purposes, even if they don't necessarily see researchers or library staff who look like them. Right. So some general advice um, if you're thinking about moving beyond traditional show and tell sessions and diversifying your items. Um, I just mentioned this, not all holdings are equally discoverable. Um, it's important to remind yourself that there's no need to be the expert or a expert, and you should always be um, continuing professional development. So when you're teaching focuses on methods of analysis or inquiry rather than solely content, this allows for students to become the expert on an object of study on their own or in small groups. Um, and you can model for your students what it looks like to say, I don't know I don't have a lot of information about you know, the production of Islamic manuscripts, but I can point you to resources. Um, you might also consider co-teaching. So you could um, either with a curator or subject librarian, or um, perhaps a faculty member in another or the same department. Of course, being mindful of how you approach this because you don't want to simply extract expertise, but collaborate and reciprocate. So what I really like to do when I'm, no matter what, uh, class I'm working with is to approach the manuscript or other item as an artifact. Um, think about its creation, its history, its users and readers. And this also mitigates language issues if your students don't have facility with medieval Latin paleography, for example. So again, that's why um, I suggest discussing manuscript production in advance. Um, so that can be the animal products and human labor that go into the production of manuscript or print books. Um, if you, you might also want to talk about international trade that uh, facilitated certain pigments um, being in Western Europe, um, such as lapis lazuli or Brazil wood. Also consider um, a focus on a diversity of formats. So rather than just using uh, codexes or single leafs, um, think about rolls and binding fragments, maybe music. And a focus on materiality means that you can also incorporate less visually compelling materials, such as deeds or unillustrated books. And in fact, I might, I might recommend not being overly reliant on visual imagery when you're uh, talking about manuscript studies. Um, again, thinking about what it means. To, um, often these Im images are uh, quite stereotypical or racialized um, images of say Saracens and Jews and Ethiopians. So how can you move beyond these um, these one-off singular representations. So in some, I think this is an easy way to be almost content agnostic um, if you focus on form and function. And some easier ways into this um, might be to include, say, a medieval scientific text that draws on Arabic sources, um, Ethiopic religious manuscripts that could be directly compared to European religious manuscripts, uh, multilingual manuscripts or Latin manuscripts with vernacular glosses and marginalia, um, but again, these are just a few ideas. So um, I want to share one activity that I use with classes. Um, so you might have a pre-reading um, that offers an example of how scholars can use manuscripts in their work and select enough items for students to work individually or in pairs, create a worksheet to guide analysis. Um, the worksheet I have in the slide is not maybe a great example of this, but I think it's good to start out very simply. So, you know, focus on the senses. What do you see? Um, and if you're in person, uh, what does it feel like? What does it smell like? Um, what do, what's the sound of turning the pages? Just don't taste, um, at least not in the reading room. Um, take advantage of the fact that sight and touch were significant um, in medieval interactions with books as well. Um, so ask your students about size, binding, material, what the uh, book is made of, how it's organized, is there a title page, a colophon, what's the overall impression of the page, is there a lot of white space, how big is the writing, are there illustrations? And these are very simple ways to um, get students to describe what they're looking at, even if they've never encountered um, manuscripts before. Then move to analysis and interpretation. So are there marks of wear or damage, use or ownership, such as marginalia or book plates? And then based on the observations above, what do you think was the intended audience or intended use of the text? Um, and this works really well with the think pair share or the jigsaw method. Um, if, you know, if you don't know what those are, you can Google them. Um, and 
you can end with discussion of areas of further exploration. Again, um, this can will naturally lead to comparisons between uh, Western versus non-Western manuscripts in materiality, such as paper versus parchment, or differences in mise en page. Um, and I'm aware that this method can be could be seen as um, problematic or tokenism if you have your you know ten uh, European manuscripts and then you have your few uh, examples of non-Western manuscripts. But I think if you weave this method in throughout the semester, that is make a discussion of the global middle ages part of your curriculum throughout the semester um, it avoids one-off classes like this being uh, tokenism in that way all right i would also suggest um, being willing to open up the time period as a way to discuss text technologies and the transmission of texts over time so one benefit of this if you're teaching in person is that it works if your university or college might not have a substantial medieval manuscript collection or just one book or a few fragments. Um, and it can lead to really interesting discussions to say, have a leaf from a book of hours, which might have been sold and prized as an art object next to an early printed book of hours. So some suggestions I have for that include early modern translations of non-Latin and Western texts, printed books with woodcuts that might depict non-European people. Um, I have a woodcut from the Nuremberg Chronicle here, and that is Mohammed um, with his blonde friends. Um, early dictionaries and grammars, especially those with signs of use. Um, modern 19th century, for example, adaptations of medieval texts, perhaps with illustration as a way to talk about medievalism and the way that our idea of the Middle Ages was conceived during that time period. All right, and then another um, activity suggestion I have is to look at the catalog. And this is great because it also orients your students to how to read a manuscript description. So first, perhaps share an exemplary catalog record and discuss its component parts, what research these enable, how complete the provenance information is, uh, whether description is searchable online or only in print, then have students uh, locate two catalog records from the same institution. So that could be, you know, one European manuscript and one non-European, uh, one Latin and one in Hebrew. Uh, you and your students can decide the parameters of this and then compare the descriptions. So uh, I have examples here from Houghton Library and it was not hard to find these examples. Um, as you can see, the Arabic manuscript is uh, poorly described in comparison to the English manuscript at bottom. Um, so again, talk about um, how detailed the records are, if there's only transliteration or if information is given in the original language, um, what does subject access look like, what terms are used for the subject access, if there's provenance information. And this is a really great exercise to start talking about classification and description. So how libraries and catalogs and therefore the scholarship they facilitate are not neutral and unbiased. You could probably also do this um, activity with manuscript sales catalogs, which I haven't done, but I think could be pretty interesting, especially from the, from the provenance perspective. Um, and that can, this can also lead to discussion of collection development history. So the expense and valorization of certain types of materials, the uneven distribution of these materials to wealthy individuals and institutions. Um, I wanted to read a sentence from Jeffrey Cohen's chapter on race in a handbook on Middle English studies because it's very appropriate to this topic. Uh, he says, no taxonomy is neutral. To classify peoples is to judge them, to sort the way world in ways that typically buttresses the privileges of a dominating collective. And that is as true of books as it is of people. Um, and I will say that Houghton Library is currently undertaking a redescription project to address problematic description in the catalog, as are many institutions in this moment. Great. So some final thoughts. Again, I will harp on this. Collaborate with librarians, archivists, and curators, especially right now, there are so many digitized resources and librarians at your institution, even if you don't have um, a robust early uh, books and manuscripts collection, can give expert advice on what your institution holds and also on finding great mat materials elsewhere. Um, and at Houghton, and I think many places like Houghton, uh, 
We're also happy to provide reference support for working with the materials in our collections and your teaching. So if you're interested in incorporating any of our digitized manuscripts, um, feel free to reach out. And here are a few sources of places I go when I'm looking at lesson planning for special collections for learning with primary sources. And if you're interested in bias and cataloging, this is a recent article that um, I found quite illuminating and you might as well. And that is all, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Our next speaker is Richard Sever. Richard Sever is an associate professor of English and the chair of the English department at Valparaiso University. His research interests and publications focus on male friendships, masculinity, and sexuality in old French romance, Chaucer, and Arthurian literature, specifically in Mallory's Mort d'Arthur. Go on, Richard. Thanks, Aphrodisia, and thank you for the opportunity to be here, and thank you for, um, yeah, the, the chance to be among this really great group of scholars, and, and uh, you know, and this is just a really great opportunity, so I'm, I'm really appreciative to the Medieval Academy for, for the opportunity. So in thinking of today's topic on race, racism, and teaching in the Middle Ages, I find myself reflecting less on race in medieval texts and more about the positionality, physicality, and identity of those who teach the Middle Ages and the students whom we teach. As a Black man, I am profoundly aware of how my immutable traits, my identity, impact and influence my teaching of the Middle Ages. For instance, some of my students at my university uh, who sign up to take my course um, no, some of them know that I'm the one who will facilitate the course, but for those who may not know me or my research area, seem to always be taken aback, at least for a brief moment when I walk into the room and introduce myself. Such moments aren't new to me, meaning I have not recently recognized that I'm a black man teaching what some may perceive as the most, you know, as the widest subjects around. I understood what I was getting myself into shortly after graduating from a historically black university and pursuing a graduate degree in a predominantly white institution. I also understood clearly that my identity as a person of color would somehow be put in jeopardy because of what I chose to study. I fully understood that pursuing research focused on medieval literature instead of Caribbean literature as I once considered would appear as if I was potentially turning my back on that one identity only to never be fully embraced by another. I knew I was going to find myself in what I described to be as an identity limbo. Cord Whitaker, stir, Cord Whitaker's stirring, uh, stirring introduction for the special issue of Post Medieval entitled Making Race Matter in the Middle Ages speaks to the heart of the matter for me every time someone discovers my area of research. Like Whitaker, Whitaker I, I too recognize as a black man teaching about the Middle Ages that my quote, body meant that I was in the wrong attire chasing the wrong foe, end quote. For me, these experiences and the feeling of not quite belonging to a, belonging or qualified to be a medievalist are not limited to the classroom. They manifest in a variety of scenarios, not excluding interactions with strangers, um, colleagues of the university, and frustratingly at conferences with others in the field, right? So it's always like, oh, wow, you're here. Um, so to make matters worse, in August 2017, white supremacists attended a violent rally in Charlottesville that left one person dead. Members of these hate groups carried symbols associated with various aspects of the medieval period. I was sickened by the image of hate, the images of hate and sheer disregard of human life, equity and dignity. I was also disturbed that this incident and these people were associated with the field that I study. Though perhaps I was overreacting, I was especially nervous that the collective we would seem to be would seem as would be seen as complicit to what was playing out in the news cycles and the media. But of course, as medievalists, we know that was not the case. Our condemnation of these of those who hijacked the symbols of the Middle Ages was swift and unapologetic. Encountering these narratives that others had created about medieval studies, we as a field continued worthwhile conversations that highlighted how concepts of race, racism, disenfranchisement, othering, and other pervasive ills found in our contemporary landscape 
also existed in the middle, in the medieval period. These conversations have occurred in, in published books, blog posts, special journal issues, conference presentations, and various other platforms and genres, especially our opportunity to have these conversations today. All great things, yes? However, we all know that bad news spreads faster than good news. I still worry of the long-term damage that, that comes with being associated with white supremacists. I especially worry that younger underrepresented audiences who struggle to see themselves or their lived experiences carried out in most materials from the medieval period have and will further distance themselves and never consider how their voices and perspectives can contribute to the field of medieval studies. And so these personal and professional struggles have inspired me to think about pedagogical techniques that allow students to recognize how they see themselves in the Middle Ages. I took my cue from previous critical work on pedagogy and built on specifically Brian Ant's Patrick's work, Vikings and Rappers, the Icelandic saga, hip hop across eight mile, which I'll share this, I'll share that with you, um, this particular, these particular sources really quickly. So I have Mark Lamont Hill's text and some others, but this one specifically is the one that I, I, I reference that kind of got me thinking about my particular approach. So Patrick's essay demonstrates how improvisation in the sagas, in Icelandic sagas, appear in a similar rap style performed by the, um, by the rap star Eminem. And she wrote, uh, notes, quote, while the saga's poems happen to differ from rap on conventions such as metaphor, rhyme, and meter, their contexts and basic functional thrusts are astonishingly similar, uh, uh, similar, end quote. I personally worry that hip hop as a genre would play to stereotypes that would inadvertently tokenize individuals in the classroom. Even though I personally grew up listening to hip hop and see it as a part of my identity as a male of color, I didn't want to make those same assumptions about others, whether they look like me or not. However, with a conscious understanding of one's audience, familiarity with the material that's being chosen, and management of classroom dynamics and expectations, this approach can yield fruitful conversations about race and identity. I find that hip hop as a genre for younger audiences actually crosses racial, economic, and class lines. Interestingly, my students know way about, they know more, way more than I do about the genre than I, th than I thought I knew when I was their age. Um, and because of everyone's familiarity, a dialogue about who's supposed to have knowledge about certain genres and fields of study is a great starting point for why someone who looks like me teaches and does research about the medieval period. So to further my point, I turn to Arthurian literature, which is my specialty, um, specifically the Holy Grail. Now the concept of the Holy Grail um, has been, you know, has been useful because many younger audiences have heard of the Grail, either in passing or through various films, such as The Da Vinci Code, um, Indiana Jones, and of course, Monty Python, right? Uh, but however, most, most only know the phrase, this is the Holy Grail of, you know, fill in the blank, right? So a phrase that's meant to suggest that someone owns or achieves something that is otherwise insurmountable. So this, our students after, you know, have um, heard or used that, that particular phrase. But after a thorough lessons about that situates the grail within a historical and literary context, students are even more surprised to learn someone like a hip hop artist like Jay-Z is referring to the, middle, to the medieval period in his 12th, his 12th studio album entitled the Magna Carta Holy Grail. In this case, Jay-Z refers to two things pertaining to the Middle Ages. It is also on this album that Jay-Z does a collaboration with Justin Timberlake on a song entitled Holy Grail. So, in researching potential meanings of the lyrics of this portion of the song, I learned that one interpretation focuses on the love-hate relationship, relationship that both Jay-Z and Timberlake have with their fame. Specifically, Timberlake laments that his journey for fame is one of uncertainty and disillusionment that often leads to disappointment. We're not given much insight into what prompts the fickle relationship between the artist and fame. We're simply told, um, 
I just can't crack your code. One day you're screaming, you love me loud. The next day you're so cold. Along those same lines, I point out that Sir Lancelot, who's one of the main characters of the Grail quest, can't seem to crack the code of the Grail. Although we all know it's mainly because of his sexual indiscretions with the queen. So that part of the story is also intriguing for students, but for obvious reasons, for other <laughs> obvious reasons. But I also point out the later moments of the Grail where Lancelot himself laments, quote, I have seen great marvels that no tongue may tell and more than any heart can think. And that had not mid my sin been before time else, I had seen much more, end quote. Though he does not fully achieve his goal, Lancelot appears relatively content, perhaps recognizing and accepting, as Timberlake lays out in his song, that fame is somehow is sometimes cruel and leads to unwanted exposure. Lancelot, throughout the, the, the quest, meets several her hermits who remind him of his sin consistently. Um, and, 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 the vulner and so he's, you know, the, the, the idea that he's reminded of this sin also shows his vulnerability. But the idea that this, this, you know, this unwanted exposure is certainly worth the chase. These themes of goal setting and acceptance of failure invite students of various backgrounds to reflect on their own journeys and lived experience that connect them to the reading. But if Jay-Z and Justin Timberlake are too outdated for your students, don't fear. It is likely they, they will also know of the artist who goes by the stage name Kid Inc. Kid Inc.'s latest single is entitled, of course you guessed it, Holy Grail. In short, in a, in a short YouTube clip about the making of the song, Kid Inc. discloses the understanding of medieval concept as he notes. Uh, and I'll just share really quickly. So he notes that the Holy Grail technically is supposed to be the cup Jesus drank out of, the Last Supper. What it symbolizes is pursuing your dream, pursuing happiness, finding eternal life, and eternal youth. So, he, and he also, and, and so we could also make the connection to the Middle Ages in the song's actual refrain, um, where the artist states, oh uh, gosh, well, I want to sh share this with you as well. So he's saying, sipping, sipping from the, this holy grail, I get motiv by, motivated by myself. The hustle made it hard to fail. Everyone rolling, gonna prevail. I just made another sale. Product falling off the scale. Money got me under a spell. Follow me, I lead the trail. So Kid Inc., not unlike Arthur's Knights, who are motivated by the social significance of the Grail Quest, is also on a journey to seeking immortal fame. I show a similar, a similar zeal in Sir Gawain's character, who's, a, who's among the first of Mallory's uh, in Mallory's Mort to Arthur to declare his desire to take on the Grail quest. Um, Gawain tells his fellow knights, wherefore I will make here a vow that tomorrow without any longer abiding, I shall labor in the quest of the Saint Grail and, and that I shall hold me out 12 months a day more if need be and never shall return to the court until I've seen, until I've seen the Grail more openly. To, so Gawain is saying that I'm gonna go on this quest and I'm going to you know, do the, all that I can to make sure I see the more, the, the, uh, see more than I've seen here. So comparable to Gawain, Kid Inc. is self-motivated and articulates a willingness to work hard to achieve his goals. He seeks to achieve his own version of the grail. Both view themselves as leaders setting an example for others. Like the money that has Kid Inc. under a spell and drives him to seek more, Someone like Gawain notes that he had seen a glimpse of the grail and he too is under a spell and determined to see more. Ultimately, both of these, individual, in these individuals value the quest or some, as may, some may say, the hustle and are seeking out ways to achieve more. Again, these passages show thematic connections between contemporary hip hop and the Middle Ages. More importantly, this exercise shows how the medieval period shows up st in students' world in ways that they wouldn't necessarily expect. By considering and incorporating alternative ways to deliver content in our classroom, we can make the field even more accessible to our young readers.
in doing so, we bring, in the converse, we bring into conversation those students whom we may not have reached otherwise, those whom we may think would never be interested because of the pervasive misconceptions and prejudices. For me, these two brief examples are the ways I find myself disman dismantling the opinion that, the medi that medieval studies is somehow intended for a single audience. I find that this pedagogical method allows my personal and professional identities to merge, thus demonstrating that conversations about race and racism in, medieval, in the medieval period should not only focus on the material from the time period, but also on the identities and the lived experiences of those individuals who study and teach the Middle Ages, both now and in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right on time. All right, our next speaker is Nahir Tanya Gracia. Let me just pull up her. Nahira Tanya Gracia is an assistant professor of English at the University of New Mexico. She was awarded a Mellon Fellowship and membership at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, where she'll be working on her book manuscript, The Other Faces of Arthur, Medieval Arthurian Texts from the Global North Atlantic. Her theoretical frameworks include translation theory and practice, the global North Atlantic, that is Britain, Iberia, and Scandinavia, and critical identity studies. Her scholarship has appeared in Comitatus, Enaratio, uh, and Literature Compass. I don't read Enaratio often enough, clearly. Her presentation is titled Violence and Migration in the Mabignogian. Go on ahead. Hello, everyone. Um, I want to echo my colleagues' thanks. I'm really honored to be here. Um, I've provided a handout and um, the handout, I've tried to make it a standalone uh, resource guide, but it also is a guide for my talk. Um, I think that you can find it at, at my page, nairotano.com slash resources. And I believe that they're gonna put it in the link here so you can see it and, and copy it. Um, I would like to start by acknowledging that I am from Puerto Rico, whose original people, the Tainos, experienced cultural genocide and other atrocities. I now live in Albuquerque, New Mexico, land of the Pueblo people. There are 19 sovereign Pueblo nations in New Mexico, as well as three Apache tribes and the Navajo Nation. I work and I stand on stolen land. Um, it's, it's also really important that I mention that I will be discussing violence through my talk, and I will be describing violent scenes. So I wanted to warn you all about this. Um, I have taught courses that deal with race and racism in one way or another for almost a decade. Most recently, I taught a, a graduate course on medieval romance and race. Um, and I understand race as a social fabrication used by societies to establish and justify systems of power, privilege, disenfranchisement, and oppression. And I understand racism as a system of advantage based on race that benefits whites. I recognize not, that not all of us work on critical race studies and that many of us are nervous that we will get it wrong. But the thing is that we have brilliant colleagues working on critical race studies in the Middle Ages we can learn from. And at a time when COVID-19 is disproportionately hurting Blacks, Indigenous, and people of color, and police brutality continues to harm Black men and women, we need to take an active role to stop racism within our communities. For the rest of this talk, I will show you several ways that I have structured my classes so that I can bring up the topic of race. Although I will be using the Mabinogian to provide examples in the second part of this talk. First, I would like to give you some of the ways that I prep myself and my students to talk about race. I have found that preparing students to talk about social struggle, struggles and race at the beginning of the course helps students throughout the whole semester. You see, each individual class doesn't need to be, doesn't need to focus on race, structural bias or power. But if you prep your students to talk about race, they will be able to bring truly insightful ideas to the classes. So how do I prep my students? Well, first, I begin with myself. I make sure that I am comfortable enough with the topic so that I can talk to my students about it. And in my handout, sections one and two uh, can help you do that. It's a links of places that you can go to and learn about, you know, talking about race, for example. I use Beverly Daniel Tatum's Talking About Race, Learning About Racism as a guide. In my first week of classes, I tell students that we will bring up 
the topic of race. And because this is a difficult topic, I would like to prepare them. First, I give my students clear expectations by providing ground rules to have discussions about race. I ask them not to share the conversations outside of the classroom, to speak to give knowledge, and then they speak from their own experiences or from what they see in the literature. I also give them assumptions that are part of the class. These assumptions include defining and explaining the differences among racism, bias, oppression, and prejudice. Another key assumption is that change, both individual and institutional, is possible. Finally, we spend considerable time thinking how racism hurts everyone in the long run. Many white people think that anti-racist work is about helping others, but it is not. I have found that many white students have a lack of coping mechanisms or they have an inability to understand other points of views. Um, after giving students these assumptions, we move to talk about whiteness and white privilege because I want my students to understand that to be white is to also have a race. In my medieval classes in particular, I tell my students that race and racism might look different in the Middle Ages, but the concept of race as a way, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to quote here, to demarcate human beings through differences in order to distribute positions and powers differentially to human groups, as Geraldine Heng writes, is very much visible in the Middle Ages. Um, and actually, section four of my handout gives you a, a really detailed list of, of how I do this. So if you're interested in, in thinking about if you want to bring up how to talk about race with your students and how to make it so that everybody's more comfortable, you can take a, a look at that. Um, so I'm going to move now to the Mabinogi. So I, I would like to use the Mabinogi to provide some examples on how I teach race in my medieval courses. The Mabinogi is what we call the grouping of 11 medieval Welsh tales that are mainly found in the White Book of Ryder and the Red Book of Perga. As I group, these texts are really quite dynamic, and I would argue that they show Welsh anxiety about their own position within the, rise, within the rising European nations, especially vis-a-vis -vis England. As Cora Lumbly writes, it is necessary to explore the role that the Welsh, who have been both outsiders and insiders in constructions of European whiteness, played as both objects and agents in the creation of medieval British racial structures, end quote. The Mabinogian shows how the Welsh respond to their positionality positionality through humanization, dehumanization, and violence. I would suggest three different ways to bring up the topic of race. I will look at the historical context, a section from the third branch of the Mabinogi, and the representation of giants in Kilhook and Alwyn. And again, um, the section three of my handout gives you uh, some of the, um, the, um, the articles that I use to prepare myself and in graduate classes, I usually give these articles to the students, not necessarily in undergrad classes. Um, first, I bring up systematic oppression through historical context. Oppression is an organized pattern of mistreatment that is woven into the culture, society, and laws. We find this in government, education, and culture. In my opinion, the best way to understand how systemic oppression works in the Middle Ages is by reading Geraldine Heng's second chapter, a case study of the racial state, Jews as internal minority in England. And I mean, you really should read her whole book, but th this chapter in particular was really helpful to, for my graduate students to understand systemic racism. So I really recommend it. Uh, Welsh scholarship has, has done a great amount of work understanding Welsh oppression through a post-colonial lens. Indeed, since the creation of Ofa's Dyke at the 8th century, the Welsh have been territorialized and essentialized, especially by the early English and the Anglo-Normans. The Welsh were in fact a large number of peoples, and the inhabitants of Wales neither called themselves by a single term nor understood themselves as a collectivity. The early English and the Anglo-Normans imagined the idea of a racialized Welsh that helped justify their conquest. Don't get me wrong, the Welsh are very real, but the image of the Welsh as created by the early English and the Anglo-Normans is steeped in bias and stereotypes and was enforced systematically. Contextualizing the fraught position of the Welsh vis-a-vis -vis the English and demonstrating some of the ways that the Welsh were essentialized by the English is key to introducing the Mabinogin. My second example shows one of the ways that the Mabinogin discusses the fraught relationship between the Welsh and the English. It also demonstrates a second tactic that I use to discuss racism in my classes. I take examples from the past that can correlate with racism in the present. The third branch gives a glimpse of the violence that Welsh might have endured in England. In what seems like an off the mark section of the third branch, a myth surrounds David and the men and women of the community disappear except for the titular characters. 
uh, and, and there are Manawaran, Prideri, Kivva, and, and Hriyanon are the, are the main characters. Although they survive of the land for two years, they decide to move. I quote, God now said Manawadan, cannot, we cannot live like this. Let us go to England and seek a craft by which we may make our living, end quote. They move to Hereford, 60 miles east from Wales and take up their craft of saddle making. Because their goods become the best in the city, the craftsmen want to kill them, forcing them to move to a new town. And I quote again, all the settlers realized that they were losing their profits and that nothing was being bought from them unless it could not be supplied by Manawadan. So they got together and agreed to kill him and his companion, end quote. The men leave Hereford, move to a new town and take up a different craft. After saddle making, they take up shoe making and finally shoe making. But each time they become the best craftsmen in the city and they're threatened with death. So they leave the town instead of fighting against the craftsmen. And finally, they just decide to move back to Dover. The scene has some striking resemblances to modern migration patterns. The work ethics of Manawadan and Prideri create a hostile environment for them because of their position as migrants. Many migrants face the risk of wage theft, incarceration, deportation, and death. I find it striking that the English craftsmen use the equivalent of the phrase, they are stealing our jobs as an excuse to enact violence. Moreover, the third branch shows how Manawadan and Prideri respond to this threat of violence. They have to choose between responding back with violence and facing the repercussions or they have to leave and move away from the danger. This example also gets at the complexities of race. How are migrants racialized? A Latin migrant might be part of the dominant group in their home country, but are racialized in the United States. And of course, not all migrants are racialized in the same way. I mean, in a very quick example, think between the idea of an expat and versus a migrant, right? Who do we call an expat? Who do we call a migrant? Manawadan and Prideri were part of the dominant group in Wales, but become migrants and victims of violence in England. From the perspective of the migrant, medieval or modern, their dehumanization leads to the threat of physical violence. Although the Welsh have many strategies to fight, fight English oppression, the kind of oppression that you saw in, my first, in this example, the strategy of shifting racism to other groups of people proved very successful. Lombly's essay, The Dark Welsh, Matthew Vernon's work on Gerald of Wales, my own research on Welsh Arthuriana show that the Welsh argued for their humanization by using the language of the oppressor, resulting in anti-blackness, anti-paganism, and the essentializing of Muslims. Here, I need to pause for a second and give a shout out to my colleague, Belinda Wallace, here at UNM, because she pointed out to me that what I want to get at beyond medieval literature itself are questions around what the text normalize. What do the materials we teach assume as the norm? Our present culture assumes whiteness as the norm at the expense of everyone else. For many of the texts I teach, what gets normalized is dehumanization and violence. And this brings me to my third and final example, which shows how Kilhook and Alwyn uses dehumanizing tactics to normalize violence against giants. So um, Philip Atiba Goff differentiates between dehumanization and prejudice. Prejudice is a broad intergroup attitude, whereas dehumanization is the route to moral exclusion. Dehumanization can lead to the denial of basic human protections to a group or group member. While prejudice would lead to devaluing a person from a disliked group, dehumanization can lead to the endorsement of genocide or extreme violence. And this is one of the things that white supremacy does. It normalizes exclusionary violence based on race. The giants in Kilhook and Owen hold territories have families, they marry humans and have children with them, some are part of Arthur's retinue, and others are killed and dismembered throughout the story. They're dehumanized and the violence done against them is normalized. So in the story, Kilhook wants to marry Olwen, the daughter of the giant is Badaden. But to do so, Kilhook must fulfill all kinds of, of demands, and he enlists Arthur's help, his cousin, to do so. Notable in the story is the amount of violence committed against giants. And I, and I highly recommend the article, Giants, Boar Hunts, and Barbering by Sarah Sheehan, because it really helps show how the, um, the tale presents a, a lot of giants and how, they are, how much violence is enacted against them. So for example, Warna Gower is decapitated, the hairs of Dujis, the horsemen are twisted out of him while he's alive, and then he's killed right afterwards. Finally, Ishbadaden's skin 
flesh and ears are shaved off. So I'm gonna quote. And then uh, Gorai, son of Kinston, grabbed him by the hair and dragged him to the tomb and cut off his head and stuck it to the bailey post. And he took possession of his fort and territory, end quote. And, and according to the dictionary of well language, and, and I know this because of Sheehan, but according to the dictionary, uh, the range of meaning of the word tum, which is translated as mouth in a lot of uh, translations, consists of dung, excrement, heap of dung, dunghill, manure, compost, dirt, filth, mire, muck, mud, mound, head. So Ishbadaden is not only killed, but he's tortured, beheaded in a pile of excrement, all the while his territories are incorporated into the Arthurian milieu. This type of violence is only possible because Ishbadaren has been dehumanized, in part by his status as a giant and by the earlier acts of violence against the larger than life. But even characters such as Kay and Gorai, who are part of Arthur's retinue, but who are also part giants suffer. They both seem to function as exotic allies, a term coined by Sierra Lomoto in the essay, The Mongol Princess of Tars. They become allies that are both feared and desired. The text, the text is making race by conditionally humanizing those that advance the Arthurian cause and dehumanizing the giant that is protecting his own territories. Kay, for example, is described as having monstrous undertones and gigantic attributes. And although Kay is one of the men sent to find the dwelling of Ish, uh, Ishbadaden, uh, he also decapitates Ornat Gaur for Arthur and he helps twist the hairs of Digi's the horseman. Arthur mocks him for fulfilling his obligations. I quote, and then Arthur said this angry. A leash was made by Kay from the beard of Dujis. Were he alive, he would kill you. And because of that, Kay sulked so that the warriors of, his, of this island could hardly make peace between Kay and Arthur. And yet neither Arthur's misfortune nor the killing of his men could induce Kay to have anything to do with him in his hour of need from then on, end quote. Arthur's poem mocks Kay for fulfilling the demands that Arthur is honor bound to accomplish. Which I find amazing, um, in a bad way. Uh, Gorai is also um, half giant, so he's half human, half giant. He's the product of the marriage of Kilhook's aunt and Ishbadaren's brother. Um, Gorai is cousin to Kilhook and Arthur, and he's acknowledged uh, as, as a cousin to Arthur in Triad 52. He belongs to Arthur's retinue, and you know he kills Ishbadaren. He kills his his uncle. And, and I cannot emphasize how violent this is. And for, to give you some more context, Owen, um, who is Ichbabaden's daughter, also helps kill Hook, knowing it would lead to her father's death. And now you have Gorai, his nephew, killing him. So the text demands that these giants and half giants submit willingly to the dominant group by killing their family members that are against the Arthurian norm. And, and so that's my final example. So I'm just gonna close up. Uh, when I teach the Mabinogian, I tend to highlight how much violence in the text, that it is portrayed as normal and nonviolent, and that it is made invisible. The same way that white supremacy makes violence against BIPOC invisible. The way that the giants are depicted in Kilhook and Owen reminds me of the ways that later medieval English romances enact violence against Muslims. Geraldine Heng writes that the raising of the Islamic Saracen did not always require the production of difference as absolutely incommensurable. For instance, under particular narrowly defined conditions, Saracens can be allowed to resemble and are praised for resembling Christian Europeans into whose company they might be imagined as inducted." End quote. In Kilhook and Alwyn, the giant is, is treated in a similar way. Under narrowly defined conditions, mainly that they have to enact violence against their own kin, they're allowed into Arthur's retinue, and even then, K is mocked. And, and honestly, if you want to know a little bit about giant, like the idea of re enacting racialized violence against giants in, like, in a historical context, I really recommend that you Google the giant Patagonians or the giant de Welches. And so this was a, an indigenous population in Patagonia who, who were very tall and were described as giants in a lot of 16th century texts. And this, this, this group of indigenous population, they were actually, in fact, dismembered and almost brought to extinction. So we have historically used the idea of a giant to bring violence. Um, I want to end 
right now, um, I want to end by echoing what our colleague Neda Medizade stated in the Folger's critical race discussion on cultivating an anti-racist pedagogy. We have to make the time to learn about race in the medieval world. We have to make time to read the amazing work of our colleagues working on critical race studies. And we have to, we have to make the time to make syllabi that allow for these discussions to happen so that our students can be better prepared to function in the field of medieval studies and in our world at large. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody. So um, we have questions to answer, but this is the first time that you've all had a chance to hear everyone else's presentations. Is there anything that you want to add or sort of comment on before we go on to the Q&A session? All good. All right, if you think of anything, feel free, feel free to sort of chime in. All right, let's go to our, our first question then. Um, uh, first question is, um, for teaching and research purposes, uh, can you point us to documents or art that show how difference based on skin color may have worked? All right, this is a question that was um, submitted before the, um, before the, uh, the webinar, but that's the question. Can you point us to some documents um, or art that shows a difference based on skin color and how that works? What are you I, I think this is a really practical question. And I, I appreciate the desire to demonstrate visually how race worked in the Middle Ages because it makes for really powerful and, and useful pedagogy. And I think in addition to the sources I mentioned in my talk or added in my big bibliography, I, I might also mention a, a beautiful essay by Bruce Halsinger called The Color of Salvation, if you want to think a little bit more about color. But I think it's also important to say that colorism or the naturalizing of somatic differences or the belief that certain characteristics were tied to skin color isn't exhaustive of what we might call racism in the medieval or modern period for that matter. Ideas about skin color in the pre-modern and indeed the modern period intersect with ideas about the body, uh, climate, and theology, and thus, and perhaps, I, I think I might repose this question to, uh, to the questioner uh, and ask you to ask it to your questions this way. Uh, when, where, and why were religious and cultural differences mapped onto the scholar, color of skin? That might be a more useful way to approach this topic. And, and I hear your paper sort of sort of spoke to that, right? That you're looking at sort of the Welsh being seen as this sort of as, as being some being prejudiced against because of their race, but clearly it's not about colorism. And it's, I mean, the Middle Ages is a thousand years, right? How the Welsh were understood at the beginning of the Middle Ages is not how they're understood at the end of the Middle Ages. And like I said, I really recommend Cora Lumley's essay because. She's one of the first people to publish uh, about this. So I really recommend her essay about, so that you can sort of think about Welsh and race together. Yeah, I think this question, oh, oh go ahead, Pep Sarah. Oh, I also wanted to point out a resource that uh, my colleague Anne Marie Easy has pointed me to, which is the image of the black in Western art. If you want just a practical resource, um, I think it's, I have it up, it's like nine or 10 volumes um, of, image of uh, artwork and that sort of thing, starting from Roman Empire all the way through to the 20th century. Um, and that's through Harvard University Press. So thank you, Anne-Marie, for pointing me to that. And I just wanted to uh, mention before we move on to the next question that um, this question, I think, also um, is, uh, we could answer it as well with uh, what Hussein was saying about the importance of provincialism and uh, what Nahir is saying about it's a very long Middle Ages that even colorism right, changes within periods, within regions. It's, it's really very complicated. So once you've got it pinned down or thinking of it pinned down in one place at one time, it's definitely going to be, it's going to change and sort of move. And just to keep that, you know, the, the, the value of provincialism sort of always forward right, in your teaching and, and research as well. All right, let me take a look at the second question here. Um, what suggestions or strategies do you have for a BIPOC that is uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color, instructors 
on managing white fragility or unspoken student resistance to discussing race in the medieval classroom. Yeah, go ahead in here. Um, so actually prepping my students, the, the first section that I talked about in my paper really helped me with that. And, and honestly, I, the first time that happened, I was surprised about it. So I, I've been teaching, you know, ideas of race and structural racism, uh, probably since I, I, I started grad school in 2006, but I used to sort of do it passively, like I well, wouldn't tell my students we're gonna have these discussions, but they, they did end up happening. And so my students always saw me as having like, you know, being so that I have a stake at this, like I'm doing this because I win something out of it. And so they always saw me as suspect. And, and even um, this last semester, which I, I didn't do it, in my class, and now I regret it, a student wrote in my evaluations that I'm racist against whites, right? So, so I would find this resistance, this constant resistance. But it, what's interesting is that when I do prep my students and I say right off the bat in the first week of classes, look, we're gonna talk about race. This is a difficult topic. So let's sort of prepare ourselves for it. I tell them, you know, I'm also nervous. I don't exactly like talking to them about this stuff. Um, I, you know, so I, I talk to them about it, we prepare. I, I, I try to tell them why this is important for everybody, for all of us. How does it help? What is the language that we're using? What does it mean? And I found that when I do that, my evaluations do, are much better. Students do really well. Uh, I don't get the same resistance. So the moment that I, that I was very active on the act of teaching race, it became much easier for my students. And I, you know, I also tell them it's okay to feel uncomfortable. You know, if you don't, you, you're probably gonna feel really uncomfortable, that's okay, sit with it. You can deal with this, you're, you're an adult now, you can do this. And it's really worked for me. I have to tell you that uh, being the chair of a Zoom session is like being a DJ, because I'm constantly checking my email to see what's going on there. So let me go and let me get us to the, um, to the next question here. It's the first time I've been encouraged to check my email on a Zoom session. Um, question three, um, there's still skepticism on whether race existed in the Middle Ages. How can we teach about race and the Middle Ages when there's no consensus that the concept was part of medieval culture? Want to take that one on? I'm happy to take it on, but uh, Sarah, did you also? I, I forget who else wanted to say something. I can go second. Yeah. Okay. I I think this is a this is a really large and important question, and I I hope I can do it some justice. I know I know there are others who could do this better than me, but there. Ha I mean, I think there has indeed been a really long presumption that modern race and racism are distinct from the medieval variant. For instance, in his Resistance to the use of the word race to, des to describe the Middle Ages, Robert Bartlett famously argued that unlike modern race, medieval race was culturally constructed. This still strikes me as a really curious complaint. After all, are modern ideas of race also not culturally constructed? And are pre-modern ideas of race not also invested in the notion of biological reproduction? Others uh, I think have argued that race is an anachronism. So why then should we lend power to an odious term by bringing it into domains that it didn't already exist? And I think this is a, a really significant objection that requires some thought. But I would respond, I think that this fear of anachronism is misplaced for two reasons. Um, first, the word race does exist in medieval sources. In romance, it moves from the language of horse breeding to describe the re biological reproduction of human differences in the 14th century. But I think relying on this argument alone or relying on it at all upon the criteria that words presence in our sources somehow makes it uh, useful or possible for us to use is really only gonna inch us back a few centuries. And thus I think the second response I have to a concern like this uh, is a little bit more important to think and dwell upon, which is to say that if we strip all anachronistic terms from the study of the Middle Ages, we would surely have our hands tied. After all, shouldn't we be equally troubled about using words like culture, religion, the economy, or even medieval for that matter? And I think it's important to say that all these words have their pitfalls. All of them have their problems. When we are speaking about race, 
as indeed when we are speaking about culture, religion, or economy, I think we are always oscillating between what Paul Gilroy in the Black Atlantic called ontological and strategic essentialisms, between defining terms so narrowly or so broadly that they do more damage than good. And this problem, this oscillation back and forth, I would say is ultimately intractable. It's an essential feature of the modern historical tradition, which in its emphasis on contingency always risks collapsing into a form of self-defeating relativism. And I would say when we confront this problem, this intractable problem, we should probably draw some instructive power from other fields, looking at the way scholars of religion, for instance, have grappled with the term religion, or by looking at the way anthropologists have grappled with the term culture. And in fact, we should think about the way we use all these terms and, and how they tell us to, or how they have criticized it. So for me, the problem really isn't about whether it's appropriate to use the word race. The challenge is really to define what we mean by it, the definitional challenge, which is not an easy one. A critical theory or history of race, particularly of pre-modern race, I think is an ongoing project. It's a fruitful discussion, and it has been a very productive way to both broaden and connect our field with other fields. Sarah? I don't have as eloquent of an answer prepared, but I would add um, that um, when it comes to special collections, um, even if the materials themselves might not have been thinking about you know, the medieval uh, writers might not have been thinking about race in the same ways. When the collections uh, were developed and acquired, um, you can be sure that the librarians and curators or the collectors were thinking about an ethnocentric, if not outright, uh, nationalistic project. Um, and that is still reflected in the way that our collections are organized and described today. Um, so, you know, the st students are operating in a world, as you said, Hussein, where race does exist and we need a way to talk about it. Um, and it's quite clear in special collections that, um, you know, we need the vocabulary for that. Samir, you had a comment? Yeah, just um, a really quick comment. And then Richard, um, I just wanted to say that, you know, having you know, differences of opinions, having critiques, having different ways to define our terminology, I think that's a really good thing, right? Because that means we're a healthy field that's growing and becoming better. Feminists don't all agree on one definition of feminism, right? We, we don't, we have, a lot of, we have a lot of disagreements, but that's what makes us healthy. I think what we don't want is to have bad faith efforts that aren't really in, in that don't really want to learn and grow and be critical in a way to so that we all are healthy in our field, but that want to actually dismantle any notion without actually uh, participating. So that that's what I would say is I I want I want healthy critique, and and I I want I I want that because that's how we be we stay healthy and and we continue to be a growing field. I just want to add to that too, in terms of if we're gonna, if, if it's it's all about semantics here, if we can talk about it in terms of just seeing difference in 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 the Middle Ages, and I think uh, a lot of our students will, um, their shared experiences will impact how they're reading um, and seeing difference being enacted in the Middle Ages as well. So I think we should be prepared to to kind of recognize that. Um, I know for me, as a as a person of color, like I read texts differently than I would imagine that other people do, and I in many ways can recognize when I see someone's not being treated like someone else, right? And so for me, those moments of differences, I don't think we want to um, gloss over them. And if our students recognize them, I think we can use that opportunity to talk about if we don't want to use the term race, but we can talk about differences and how difference is being used to um, to put people in the margins and to, to disenfranchise individuals. And so those things were happening in that time period just as much as they're happening currently. And so I think um, students will recognize those, or I think, you know, depending who we are as readers, uh, if we're, if we're not, uh, if we're in, unable to recognize that, we should certainly um, recognize when our students recognize it, or see it happening. Thank you. All right, my email's kind of blowing up here, so. Um going to do my best as we organize this. Actually, the very first question we got was, uh, I don't think a question you all can answer. It was more of a sort of a cri de coeur. Um, I'll summarize it for you. 
know if you uh, have any way of really responding to this. Um, in a nutshell, um, is the U.S. has a proud history for liberty, freedom, democracy, and human rights, and yet why do police and some politicians have this incredible sense of discrimination? Why do we still have sort of modern slavery? And I said, I don't know that you can answer that, but I think it's just somebody who's, you know, at that point, uh, you know, that so many people have gotten to. But it is an important question in terms of, like, what do you do when we get back to the classroom and that, and that question gets asked of you? Like what's, like, what's going on? Like, how do we give the students leadership to sort of navigate through this particular moment? You say? You know, I think one of the, the things I've always loved about teaching the Middle Ages is that uh, it creates a chance for us to move a little bit away from the present, uh, to focus on a primary source, and then find our way back to it, that oscillation back and forth. The distance sometimes gives us a chance to talk about things in a way that we wouldn't otherwise. Um, I know for my students uh, in, in my classes, we talk a great deal about Islamophobia. We talk about attitudes towards Muslims and attitudes of Muslims towards others. Um, and it becomes a, a place, talking about primary sources in particular, staying close to primary sources for them to voice concerns and voice opinions that they might not otherwise. And I think sticking with pedagogy, sticking with what we know works in this moment will both uh, calm our own anxiety about the world outside coming into, although we're not gonna be inside and we're not gonna be with our students in the fall, I imagine most of us. But, uh, but I think pedagogy becomes an answer to that very question or a way to deal with it. Anyone else? All right, move on to the next question. All right, our next question, um, I'll try to uh, abbreviate it. I've been thinking about how medieval studies could connect to police and prison abolition, in addition to pushing campuses to defund police. As someone who studied medieval heresy, with respect to the to dialogue with Angela Davis's work exploring parallels between the way the concept of heresy is constructed and policed in the Middle Ages and the concept of crime today. Do people have any other thoughts about medieval studies and how medieval studies could connect to prison abolition, and I would add, or heresy? Aya? Um, but I don't have an answer, but what what I will do is, is point out that Race Before Race has a, an event happening, I think this week, about looking at policing and the Middle Ages. I, be, I believe, I'm sorry, out of the top of my head, I think our Carissa Harris and Kurt Whitaker are, are part of it. Um, so I'm just gonna say you go there too, listen to them and, and, and I think you, you, you get ideas. The next question. I teach in Houston at a large public MSI. Most of my students are non white. Demographically, Texas is fast approaching majority minority status, and the US generally is headed that way as well. What happens when we accommodate and acknowledge these demographic realities and these class predominantly white space? You broke up a little bit, so after, can you repeat that? Sure. Last bit. Yeah, my, my internet's doing funny things. What happens when we accommodate and acknowledge these demographic realities and cease conceiving of the medieval studies classroom as a predominantly white space? So this person teaches in, um, you know, a non-white majority institution. Here. No, go ahead. So I, I teach at New Mexico, the University of New Mexico. We are a majority minority institution. I believe over half of our students are, are Latinx in one way or another. Um, in, and also we have a lot of Native American students. So uh, the students I teach also a lot of um, non-traditional students as well. So the students I teach now are very different from the students I taught um, even a year ago. So, um, but what I found is that our, you know, my students do have very different experiences, which means that there are things that I do have to bring out differently, but they also growing up in the same United States, watching the same shows as my students, wow. the same news, 
as my student from other places. So I, um, um, so I, I find that, that then it becomes, you, you have to navigate that, right? You have to be like, what, what experiences are different, right? And so my example with the, the, my second example that I gave, which looks at, that I compared to migration works really well here in, at my institution, but also what are the things that they still need to work on? I, and I found that they still struggle with race, uh, even though, you know, we would think that maybe they wouldn't, but they do. So they still need that help. So I would say that it's, it's that balance of, of remembering that these, that if, if you, even if you're in a majority minority institution, your students are still growing up in the same society that is still creating these uh, systems of oppression and are trying to curate hierarchy. So you still have to work with that. And emphasize too, I think what I do um, is, is show just how pervasive and and this this mindset is and look how far back it goes. And so in showing that the urgency of of, of thinking about things that that you know that something needs to be done, right? And and ways to think about that. Um, and yeah, and I use the Middle Ages to show like, yeah, this isn't new, right? So I think one of the things that's different now is like, yeah, people will, are still, you know, they shower now, but you know, <laughs> you know, back in the day, it, this, these concepts were were still um, were still happening, and so these these mindsets are so entrenched and, and so pervasive. So showing the students that, especially that are part of an underrepresented group, that there's this really a sense of urgency if we're gonna if we're gonna turn this around. Thanks, guys. I'm working on some tech issues back here in the back backstage. All right, let me get you to the next question. This question is inspired by Richard Severe's talk, but is open to anyone, everyone. While racial representation is important to consider in the field, what do we do regarding class differences? Given ongoing trends in academia, funding, and the economy, how do we prevent a future in which studying the humanities, especially the Middle Ages, is something seen as for a privileged class. How do we make inclusive classrooms for everyone? And how do we help colleagues from working class backgrounds navigate academia and find success in the field? Yeah, I think it's one of those things that, I'm, uh, that I, I, I pointed out earlier, is really helping individuals to find and see themselves and see how themselves uh see how they, th their selves can be represented in, in in these texts and in in the work that we do um and and showing that sometimes what not what may not be obvious connections but really helping our students and lead our students into those conversations i think is really helpful um for them to understand and be able to see themselves and not have these kind of um, distinctions and differentiations that they don't belong or that this is something that's exclusive to a particular group and not others and i think it's it's really our responsibility as educators to really um help them down that that particular path i don't want it to be again something that's forced or that something that could you know potentially be traumatic for the students but really helping them to um, recognize the some of the clear connections that they can make between their shared and lived experiences and what's going on in the text and i think that you know choosing the text that we we do um carefully is important um you, you know in terms of the when i teach medieval class, uh literature i always make sure that i, I bring in Sundiata, which is a you know African um, text, and and make sure that the students even if we if we're gonna talk about even color, um, and that students see themselves represented and see how they they too contributed to this idea of the of the Middle Ages. So that's one of the things that I I, I recommend um, in in terms of having those conversations, and we and that could be about class and and things like that because there's a lot of distinctions and a lot of uh, work that will will show distinctions in class. I mean, there's huge hierarchies going on in the Middle Ages. And so I think it's really accessible to have those conversations with our students. Yeah. I would say uh, when I'm working with undergraduates, especially, I think back, I didn't really think of being a librarian or an archivist as a career when I was an undergrad. And it was only in grad school that I realized that it's a job. Um, and I honestly think there needs to be like more fundamental systemic changes before uh, this type of career might be actually attractive to 
Oh, did I pop? I didn't. Okay. I thought maybe everyone was frozen. Okay. Yeah. I think there needs to be more systemic changes before, um, before I would necessarily recommend to, you know, students from um, different socioeconomic backgrounds or people of color to join the profession because ultimately it's quite a low paying profession, all things considered. Um, and our archives and special collections have huge issues with contingent labor and term positions. And I think it's important that students who might be interested in the field are aware of those challenges before they enter them. And I mean, you can encourage the students all you want to consider it, but um, those are issues we have to contend with. Anybody else want to talk about class in the class? Yeah, it makes me um, think about Hussein's sort of audit and um, that I could be doing more with that in the classroom and I teach the Middle Ages. I mean, you let students know that, yes, we're talking about the 1% the here, um, you know, um, and there's, there are many, many more stories uh, that, I, that we're not gonna get to in the class and then I go ahead and, and, you know, and teach the 1%. Um, so there's, there's, there's more that can be done. I think, I think that um, the, the question is a, rel is a relevant one. Yeah, I, I might add that like it, this question of class also makes me think, or one of the things that often runs in my mind is, how we how we explain the value of what we're doing and if we explain that value in terms of its job market value or what job it leads to we are likely doing a disservice not only to what is fundamentally the education that they're receiving is about but also uh, yeah we're we are limiting access to some degree to the kind of work we do and if it's frankly if they're <laughs> if they're looking for a well-paying job being a medievalist is not one of them um, so I think that's, a, again, how we value our work and what we understand value to be is, I think, a critical way of, of approaching this topic. All right, let's move on to the next question. All right. Uh, so question for Sarah. Thank you very much for your helpful paper. How does making manuscripts accessible differently impact Harvard and other institutions? Uh, for context, I was responsible for a rather significant medieval manuscript collection for nearly 10 years. I did everything I could to let people know it existed on social media, etc. I still have to tell people about it. So a library position uh, at an elite institution has a very different meaning than one in a different place. Uh, and that's uh, more or less the question, right? Um, and could you think about ways to modify your worksheet for sort of different, um, different institutions? Um, if, if I'm understanding correctly, is this a question about outreach and how to make sure students and oh. faculty are aware? Um, so, yeah, and um, several of the questions have addressed, just to have in the back of your mind, um, uh, the tension uh, uh, that exists uh, when um, educators from like elite universities, you know, in really secure positions talk about a topic versus like other people yeah. working in other kind of situations. Um, well, I think in some, uh, for all the horrible things going on uh, in the world, at least with online teaching, um, everyone has well, not equal access, but um, we have access to the same digitized manuscripts um, at many institutions. So I think that provides a great opportunity for um, instructors from a range of institutions to take advantage of more well-endowed repositories. Um, I would also say that um, so this is based on my experience working at Swarthmore College, which I know is not, you know, is, is a very well endowed uh, liberal arts college, but um, their rare book room was, you know, very poorly cataloged, not really used um, by, by faculty. And um, I think if you create partnerships with librarians and um, I think you'll find that there are lots of materials in collections that are actually really amazing and could be really good teaching tools um, that aren't just are simply aren't discoverable online. Um, so there's no easy answer to that question, but um, I hope that some of the ideas I had for incorporating, you know, printed books instead of just relying on manuscripts could also be a helpful way to think about it. Um. There's another question I actually forgot uh, sort of early on and a, a parallel question that um, is kind of directed at, at Sarah as well. So let me, let me get to that. 
how might our work change when instruction is done remotely? Does a Zoom classroom environment change the efficacy or implementation of any of the approaches suggested? Um, um, also for Sarah, thank you so much for your talk. Do you have any advice on teaching the archives if your university is online only and it's restricting access to the archives? Are there creative ways to get past this favorite and relatively accessible online archives for students to browse? Um, any suggestions there? Um. I'd say uh, the digital scriptorium is a good place to start if you're interested in medieval manuscripts. Um, I mean, I, I'll say this having just come from the Beinecke. The Beinecke has, I think, all of its um, pre-1500 books, and or not books, but manuscripts at least, uh, digitized. Um, and, you know, it's, I know it's very different to interact with manuscripts in a digital environment, and you can't, you, you lose a lot of affective uh, clues that are really important for interpretation. Um, that's one, th those are a couple sources I would suggest. And also Houghton has digitized many of its manuscripts. Um, <laughs> uh, there was a second part to this. Oh, um, and in terms of just generally teaching online, I think I didn't have an opportunity to teach online at all this past semester. And it's still something that we are thinking about at Houghton how to uh, convey the organization and materiality of special collections through digital means. Um, so we're thinking hopefully about having you know, docu cams where at least one person can hold and manipulate materials. You need, it's important to have a sense of scale, which you can't do when you're looking at something in a browser. Um, I don't have, sorry, I don't have more articulate thoughts at the moment since I haven't actually done any online teaching. I think it'll be an iterative learning process. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I imagine that your exercise looking at classifications, right, um, uh, it's something that you could translate easily to the online class. Did anybody else um, teach remotely last semester and have anything to add about their experiences? It was a learning experience for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> that's my positive spin on that. <laughs> it was definitely a learning experience. And uh, I think my students and I, you know, we, we, we relied on each other in terms of uh, how we're gonna get through that. So I think, you know, and I think these, this, this material specifically what I'm doing, um, works well uh, on a digital platform and, and can still be a way to be engaging and, you know, give students an, op, uh, an excuse to pull up YouTube when they should be in class. So uh, finding ways to do that, I think, is important to, to get students engaged and exciting. And if that's what you have to do to make that happen, um, you know, I, I think it, it, it can work. Um, but I, I, like I said, I, I prefer to have the face-to-face -face interaction, but I definitely understand the times we're in. and. and Certainly, it's better to be careful. Um, so if, if the opportunity presents itself, then um, by all means, you know, figure out ways how to incorporate the internet and, and things like that, I think would be uh, um, an approach to getting the students engaged. I, I had something else I forgot to say too. Um, and I haven't actually done this, but I think it would be really cool to, um, so this is more thinking about archives. Um, uh, to create facsimiles, so print, uh, you know, double-sided, high-resolution uh, facsimiles of digitized, you know, letters or other manuscripts. Um, it, you might have heard of letter locking, um, so the practice of holding and sending letters in the late medieval and early modern period, and you can create um, facsimiles for students to fold and use themselves at home um, and I think you could do a similar thing looking at um, book formats. You could maybe have, I know the Folger and probably some other, um, I think Sarah Werner's website also has some printable folios and printable quartos. So you can have students, you know, fold and bind their own, own books at home. So those are a couple other ideas. So I've, I had to teach online because of COVID and I've taught online uh, classes that were desi designed to be online. So all the students 
you know, um, signed up to an online class. Um, which, and these were two very different experiences. Um, so I had students who didn't have internet. So the only way that they could look up the materials was through their phone. I had students who had COVID and so were sick. I had students whose family had COVID and they, had, they were sent away and were really distressed. I had a student who the police showed up at her house. So I had a, a lot of students with a lot of very different needs. So I couldn't, I did not do synchronous classes, right? Um, I, I would create materials for them. I ended up giving a lot of them my phone number, some of them giving them the option to just telling me what they think on the phone so that I can give them a note. I had students who were excellent, who disappeared on me and it doesn't matter how much I wrote to them. You know, so, so that experience for me was not the same as when you have a class that is that is designed online where the students say, I'm gonna sign up to an online, online class. So when, when I did design an online class, I found that one way that I could get them really excited is I, I made them create a, a retelling of, of the stories that we were studying. So it was a, a, a fantasy class. And I did both like early, early text that, that have fantasy elements as well as sort of fantasy text. And so the, the earlier text, they had to make them modern. And then the, the modern text, they had to make uh, sort of like older or medieval, right? And then, and then the rest of the class had to explain what it is that, that was changed by the retelling. And so how is the retelling changing the story? And so by comparing the, the creative text that their, their, their colleagues did to the original text and trying to find ways to, to explain what was happening really got them engaged. And I made sure to say that this had to be always positive, right? Like we're not here to say why our, our colleagues did a, a text, we don't like it. It's about comparing and trying to figure out the thought process of our colleagues. And they really got really excited about that and they all participated. Um, one of the years they really wanted a, a booklet with all the stories so I had to like compile of them and, and send them an email. So that, that was a, a an exercise that worked really well for me online and got them really engaged. She's managing the barrage of emails I'm getting. So we're getting to the last 10 minutes or so of the, of the webinar and we still have um, a lot of questions. So I'm trying to sort of um, sift through to get to um, uh, questions about topics we haven't covered yet. So um, uh, this one, um, uh, thank you for all your presentations. Uh, I kind of mentioned this before, I'm struck that you are all full-time employees and most full-time tenured or tenured track professors with access to research materials and funds. Can you please speak to the struggles of adjunct NTT contingent faculty who have far fewer resources and are often minorities? You want. I can start. Yeah. Um, so I've been on the job market since 2012. I, I graduated in 2014 and I got my first job uh, last year. So I spent a long time not um, as, as tenure track. Uh, when I was a grad student, um, there was a blackface incident in my institution and I was very uh, involved in in trying to um, make awareness about it and so I was told that I wasn't going to get a job because of it. Um, so I sometimes I'm really happy that I'm here because I I was told that it would be very hard for me to be here. Um, so but what I realized is when when those things was happening was that if I didn't deal with these topics, so sort of the topic of race, if I didn't make these things important, then the problem will be that I, I need to live with myself as a person, right? And, um, and so if, if I don't make these things part of my curriculum, and if I don't do my best to do it, I mean, like I said, I've been doing this as a grad student, then I would just, would not be myself. So that's why I did it. And I don't know if that gets at the answer, 
but I was just, I, I worked with what I had, always with what I had. Uh, my resource page, it's all online. It's all links that you can find online. I made it specifically that way so that everybody can access it. Um, and so, you know, the reality of that is that if you're doing innovate, really innovative things, you're always going to have to work harder, always, because they're going to make it hard for you, always. So, um, so yeah, so it, 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 you have to be creative and you will have to work hard and you have to, to do it because you want to. So that's my answer. And I knew really. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ava Teacher. No, I'd say that's a. It is a really um, hard question. I have. Um, I was looking through the the list of uh, different positions, and I've had them all. I've been an adjunct. I've been contingent faculty. I've been tenured. I got the whole gamut, you know. Um, and uh, I don't have a better answer, I think, than than Nair, which is yeah, it's not easy. You have to work extra hard, and that's kind of always been the case. And um, um, I like to think that with this sort of new generation of particularly um, uh, medievalists of color, that there, is, that there is a community that gives you a lot more support than when I, was, when I was coming up. And I was the only medievalist of color that I knew. And so I didn't have a community of people that I could talk to. Uh, Richard? No, I was gonna say along those same lines, and I think it's important to utilize that network of people and, and, you know, and know that you have a community and you have a support system of people who are willing to help in any way that we possibly can. You know, as someone who's part of that group, like, um, you know, if there's anything that I can do, if there's, you know, whatever it is, you know, into my capabilities, you know, I, I want to do that. And so finding ways to do networking and, and um, sort of um, mentorship programs and things like that. It's one of those things that you don't want to go through this by yourself and know and find out ways that you can interact and engage with people because I can imagine the frustration and the just kind of being in the margins and, and, and not knowing the, you know, especially the consistency of your positionality in a particular institution that has to be frustrating. So, I mean, please reach out and, and reach out to your networks and, and form those relationships and form those sense of communities. Um, I think that's really important in a way to, you know, to, to get through a lot of this. I, th I think I would also, you know, I, I cannot s speak to that experience and, uh, but I can turn the lens on myself and I would ask other scholars who are extremely fortunate and extremely privileged to turn the lens on themselves and ask themselves, what have they done to contribute to these set of circumstances? In what ways are they advocating for their fellow scholars? I hope, although I imagine there are some, I hope fewer and fewer scholars who have tenure track or tenured positions imagine that they are better than everyone else or that it was strictly a meritocratic criteria that brought them there. Um, uh, I feel very fortunate and I do feel a deep burden and responsibility to mentor, to advocate and to, in, in the ways that people reached out and helped me because I was in privileged places, I try to do that with students who don't have the same access and accessibility and I try to do it consciously. I have to say that it's something that you have, to, that I have to continually remind myself of as well. It's easy to become complacent. It's easy to enjoy the privileges you have or to speak about them as though they're normal. Um, I guess I would add, I don't, I, I was sort of conscious when I was giving my paper that the other panelists talked a little bit about their own uh, their own background and positionality, and I didn't, um, and I don't really like to, but, you know, there's a reason I didn't enter a PhD program. I had, you know, envisioned from undergrad that I would do a PhD in medieval history, and I didn't feel at all supported, and I honestly, it's hard to even think of myself still as a medievalist, despite my position, and it took me some time to sort of reorient my vision of my future to special collections and archives, and I don't ever forget how like really privileged I am to be in my current position. And I'm always happy to talk to students who are interested in a career in special collections or archives and how, how they can maybe make that work for them. Yeah, we actually had a question about, uh, sort of a pipeline question about how do you get more students from more diverse backgrounds sort of into the field? I think you've kind of answered it in terms of like, you know, there are networks now that people can reach out to. and. Um, Back to pedagogy, we have a question. Um, we actually have two questions and I'll just use one because they kind of overlap. Uh, great presentations. Thanks to the panel 
a topic that most people will assume is connected to race is the topic of slavery. This was not raised in the presentation, yet there was a lot of slavery in uh, medieval Afro-Eurasia. How do the panelists discuss it? Yeah, Hussein. Yeah, in my big bibliography, I mentioned, mentioned Michael Gomez's work, and I think that's a valuable place to start. I think there's also a, a great danger to overdetermine the connection between race and slavery, or to assume somehow that um, those two work hand in hand. So I would say, yes, that there is an interesting story to be told about the intersection of the two, but we may not want to obsessively focus on on the connection between them. I can see that. Um, this is another moment um, in my own syllabus where I could I could do some work. Uh, I teach the Arabian Nights in one of the introductory courses, and the students always notice that there are black slaves, and they always notice right um, how the black slaves are being talked about, right? The, the discourse around them, and so we you know I talk about it a little bit, but I'm like. I need to unpack this a little bit more, like, you know, with the students. Um, uh, so the answer to the question is, you know, I, 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 do, I do it, I don't do it well, I could do it better. Because it is there. <laughs> it, is, it is definitely there. Um, you know, I think I actually am going to um, do that, maybe to, to close that last pipeline um, question. So I think it's a little bit, uh, it's interesting. Uh, following these helpful ideas of what to do in the classroom, how can we apply this recruitment for our classes, majors, student clubs? If students are seeing the appropriation of the Middle Ages by white supremacist groups, as Dr. Sever commented, how can we encourage a more diverse group of students to take that first step towards medieval studies? How can we signal medieval studies as an inclusive space before students step into our classrooms? It's a good one to end on. Being novel and finding ways to connect them, right? Finding, you know, for me, I'm always, and you know, this it helps that you know, I I did my dissertation on bromance, and I do all sorts of things that connect the the time period to uh, contemporary. Because I I think for me, that's ways to to recruit and get students excited about it, it's, and to make those those sometimes not obvious connections in terms of how they're thinking and how they're um, seeing their contemporary world and, and how to connect that to the Middle Ages. And even when you, and it's in issues and conversations about um, race and, and being marginalized and things like that, those conversations can, can always uh, coincide and, and, happen, and happen alongside one another. So for me, that's one of the things, and it helps you know, to have somebody who's underrepresented who's doing this work and, and for students to see like, oh, wow, that, you know, there's a, uh, you know, there's a precedence for, for someone who, who may look like me to, to be engaged or to be involved in this, in this field. So I think that's really important. And if it's not the case, but trying to really find uh, ways to connect the field to students, I think that's how we're going to get our field to, to continue to thrive is to um, have students recognize and see their, their world experiences and their, and their lived experiences being um, shown in, in the time period. So any way I can possibly think of doing that, I'm always finding ways, all right, like what can I do? What's going on in contemporary world? How can I say, ah, actually this is medieval. And so it's fun. It's a fun way actually to, to, to think about it. Uh, uh, Hussein and Nair. I, I'm a counselor of the Medieval Academy of America. So maybe I'm, I'm saying this because I'm a counselor, but I would say we should demand of the Medieval Academy of America to do more work uh, than it's doing and to continue to apply itself to rectifying this problem. It is a large institution, it has a platform, it has money, it has resources. Um, it can increase its representation and it should increase its representation of scholars of color so that when young medievalists look around them, they see them and they see that it is a viable and real path. Um, I, do, I know that there are things coming in the pipeline through the Medieval Academy of America, and I'm proud of the kinds of things they're doing now, but we should continue to write and demand that those things happen and those things be taken seriously. Mayor? Oh, okay, to sort of add to that, um, before you even think about how to bring students into medieval studies, right, from your own institution, wherever you are, you need to think about do you have the resources to make sure that your students thrive there? Or are you bringing your students in to fail? 
capital because you haven't done any systematic changes in your institution that will make them do better. So even before you start thinking about how do I bring in more students, you have to think about do I have the how do I create the resources that they need so that they can thrive here? Because if you do that, if you create the, the spaces that are safe for them, that can help them do better, they show, students show up. Our students are amazing. They, they want to do all kinds of different types of work. They want to branch out and, 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 and do what they want. So we have to make sure that those spaces are there so that when they get there, they thrive and they do well. So before even we think about the pipeline, we have to think about are our spaces going to help our students thrive and how do we do that? So I think that's, that's the important question for me. Also, if we can be deliberate about our outreach too, I think that's going to be important, right? Because as a person who, like I said, I, you know, how much are we talking about um, interaction engagement with HSIs and HBCUs in terms of how the, the field's being taught in those institutions? I, we don't hear enough of those scholars. We don't see enough of those scholars. I don't know if, that, if enough of that is happening. And so being deliberate, I think, is, is really important. And I hope that um, different professional organizations will, will take that into consideration when we think about outreach and, and thinking about ways to engage individuals in the field who who have been underrepresented for so long. Yeah, and I think that starts at K through 12 as well, right? It doesn't just begin when they turn 18. Um, all right, our time has come to an end. So let me just wrap up and then hand it back to over to Lisa Fagan Davis. Um, I would love to continue this conversation with the people in the audience um, about these questions and hopefully when the pandemic is over and when conferences return, we can continue um, these discussions together. Uh, this is clearly just the beginning of a much longer and a more profound conversation. We had over 900 people registered for this event, which I'd like to interpret as interest in this important topic, but also in, in this important turn in medieval studies, the consideration of, of race. So I encourage you all to read or to read further on the topics of race, racism, and teaching in the Middle Ages. We hope to continue the discussion with further webinars. Again, I want to thank um, Geraldine Hang, the Medieval Academy, our participants, and our audience members for um, spending this time with us. Lisa, you want to take it away? Yeah, I'll just wrap things up again, uh, thanking our attendees, of course, our panelists for your time and your efforts, uh, Aphrodisia for chairing, and also Geraldine Hang for her role in getting this organized. Uh, I am also grateful to you, uh, Hussein, for your thoughts. I agree with you absolutely that this is work that the Medieval Academy needs to do with intention. Um, and it's uh, work that we are ready to do and that uh, is going to, um, that has gotten started and will continue to happen as we work to create a field and a medieval academy of America where medievalists of color feel that they have a home and where they feel uh, respected and heard and safe and, uh, and welcomed. And I would invite all of, our pan all of our attendees to visit the Medieval Academy website if you are not already a member and um, explore the website and see who we are and what we're doing uh, and consider becoming part of the Medieval Academy and joining our community of over 3,500 uh, medievalists worldwide. And then finally, I would invite you to, uh, on our homepage, medievalacademy.org, you will see a link to a webinar tomorrow on best practices in teaching online pedagogy, tools and techniques specifically for medievalists as we all, uh, myself included, work to get our courses online for the fall. You do need to pre-register uh, and this will take place tomorrow from 2 to 5 p.m. Um, Eastern time. And on that note, uh, I will bid you all farewell and I hope to see you tomorrow and I hope we will continue these extremely valuable conversations in the future. Thanks very much.